And that, that's my whole thing. Maori aren't oppressed by the white man. They're oppressed by ideology. In this case, left-wing ideology, progressive ideology. They're being oppressed by the very ideology they themselves adopt. They're oppressing themselves. It really isn't that hard to figure out. But it actually takes thinking for yourself. Which people aren't a fan of these days. They just aren't a fan of it. Uh, so today, what I've got for us all is a, a video by someone who he thought he would give me a little bit of shit online, um, particularly today. Um, and, and, and you know what? I'm someone who is thoroughly, uh, he thoroughly appreciates political discourse and, and, and having a conversation with others, particularly those I disagree with about it on X of all places. But but of course, he, he decided he would come out and. Um, have a go at me about the various different political ideologies I hold, which he has no idea how to articulate. But it did get me interested. What is this guy's views? What has this guy got to say? Um, and, and funnily enough, I stumbled upon the first video that popped up for me of his, and I thought it was fascinating because it's a it's not a right wing individual's take on why the separatism movement in New Zealand is going to fail miserably. And whilst there are a few things in here I agree with, there are other things in here which I thoroughly disagree with as well. Um, and that's more or less why I want to go into them. I keep seeing people advocating for radical pro-Maori policies. Whether or not these policies are actually pro-Maori is debatable. But that is not what I want to speak about here. I want to speak about the seriousness of these proposals. These radical pro-Maori policies that I keep seeing people advocate for. A separate Maori parliament, a separate Maori law, giving Maori total control over New Zealand, giving Maori total control over most, if not all of the land in New Zealand. These radical pro-Maori policies. I think that most of these policies are undesirable, but I also think that arguing about their desirability is almost a waste of time. Because these policies will never happen. They are politically unviable. They are a pipe dream. They will never receive the level of popularity needed for such radical policies to be introduced. And this is the interesting part where I think he starts off. Is he, his position is that we don't need to worry about these things. You don't even need to talk about these things because they will never happen, based on the idea that because they are politically unpopular, they will not happen. Well, I'll give you an example of something that was politically unpopular. Here, poor, poor. That was politically unpopular. That doesn't mean that Herr Purpur wasn't commissioned. That doesn't mean that the people responsible for producing the report did not do what they did and produce it to recommend what it did. And that did not stop the Labour government of the time beginning to implement elements of those recommendations from the report. That did not stop the Labour government implementing things they'd never campaigned on in the first place. That did not stop the last Labour government from implementing things like race-based decision-making in our water management. Having a not technically separate, but separate health system, which caters directly to one ethnic group, right? That's what, exactly what they did. So it doesn't need to be politically popular for it to be a risk. And they don't need to campaign on it in order to implement it. Now, of course, in the long term, that would be political suicide to implement something you never campaigned on, which would be, you know, repugnant to the majority of voters. But if you have no intention on caring and you are looking to entrench a completely new system, then, I mean, at the end of the day, you are getting what you want across the line that it makes dramatic reform in the way things work. And then you can maybe sit out for three, six, nine, twelve years until people have a short memory and forget about it, right? I mean, let's be honest. What did the last Labour government do? An absolute shit ton, which all of us really have ne been negatively impacted from. That's not going to stop half the population voting for them over the next three to six years. Or at least a good 30 to 40 percent. That's not going to stop them having 40 to 50 percent of the support. 
you know, being that the opposition with Labour, Greens, and Party Māori. As of right now, their average support is sitting around 42-43% of the population, with the government only sitting around 53-54. So despite all of the damage that we um, that we went through as a nation over the last six years, we are still going to have large portions of the, of, the, of the population supporting those who did the damage. You know, the amount of damage that Te Pāti Māori have done with actually really no power over government at all in the last well, three, four years has been dramatic. They've actually managed to convince people that we should be having a discussion on race and that we should be considering having two separate systems that we should, funnily enough, support racism whilst also telling us not to support racism. That's the whole messy deal with the party Māoris. They don't, their whole position's a little bit incoherent. How dare you be racist, also support our racism. That's the party Māori in a nutshell. So it, it, it leaves the question, is there ever going to be an actual, is there ever going to actually be a threat of the policy that the party Māori hold coming into fruition? Well, I, I suppose a lot of that is predicated on, or, or dependent, on what Labour decides to adopt from an ideological perspective, or what the dominant left-wing party decides to adopt. Because we know the Greens will get behind a lot of what the Party Māori say. They can 100% get behind the idea of race-based systems. I mean, Labour started implementing exactly that. Now, of course, you could argue that the Māori, uh, the Labour Māori caucus is very much compromised and basically just a infiltration of Te Pāti Māori ideology into the Labour Party. But it, I think it's a very valid concern where we look at what Labour is proposing in the last election, um, or what they had done up to that point, what to party Māori are proposing and what the Greens are proposing as a way forward for this nation. And we have to realise they have become very radical compared to 6, 12, 18 years ago. Very radical by comparison. So the idea that it would be completely out of out of the option out of the question. Out of the question that they would decide to implement something that is consistent with the extreme pro Māori policy that this guy's talking about. It's not out of the question. It's never out of the question. And unless we speak about it, it may very well come upon us faster than we may think. And that's why winning the last election was so important. <laughs> because without doing that, there is no knowing just how bad of a position our country would have been in in 2026. They will never receive the broad public support that they would need to be implemented. Politically, these policies are just completely unviable. They have no potential for broad public support. They are not serious proposals. Major constitutional and economic policies like these can never be achieved without massive public support. That level of public support will never be secured because these policies are not even remotely appealing to the average person, and they never will be. Even many Maori find these policies to be laughable. You will never get the average Pakiha to back them. And if you cannot get the average Pakiha to back them, they have no political future. Because Pakiha are the majority, and they hold disproportionate power on top of that. And, and yes, he makes a very good point here, and I do apologise, I am just trying to pull up the chats that I missed. Um, he does make a valid point here of the Pakiha are the majority. But when a majority of the Pākehā are very mixed, are very mixed in their opinion on these matters, it um, that raises a, a kind of a concern behind that argument. Okay, the issue is, is if we look at if we were to go look at um, European New Zealanders' um, voting habits, what percentage of the of that majority do you think vote in favour of Act New Zealand First type policies? Right, you're not looking at many. How many support national? You're getting a pretty uh, much larger chunk there. But national are probably, whilst they would never go to this length, they're only one party and they are still a little bit, uh, what's the best way of putting it? They're still a little bit too 
keen on some of the co-governance arrangements um, that have happened over the last 10, 12, 14 years. So, you know, they're not the most um, they're not the most anti um, this kind of policy that, you know, that there is, um, if that's the best way to put it. So, you know, we can't rely on national, um, whereas Labour, you know, they're the other main um, party that gets a good chunk of the European New Zealander vote. And so long as they're getting a good amount of the New Zealand European vote and have the ability to lead a government, we are in a bit of strife here. Because as long as a Labour government includes either the Greens or Te Party Māori or both, there is a very real threat of more and more extremely radical policies, the likes of which the Greens and Te Party Māori advocate for, getting pushed over the line. For example, I mean, it's just it's the it's the literal arguments made every single um, well, every single day. You'd really argue you buy the opposition at the moment as to why there are a lot of so-called unpopular policies being passed under this government. It's because of actor New Zealand First, or it's because New Zealand First has been introduced into the coalition because they had no other choice at the being forced to implement all this radical policy, all this unpopular policy. You know, things like expecting that women uh, are able to use their bathroom or their changing rooms without blokes walking in. You know, those sorts of radical policies. So it's like, if it works one way, then it can work the other way. The same argument could apply to Labour being forced to implement some radical Māori policy, to party Māori policy, because they're forced to work with them in a hypothetical situation that we could find ourselves in in 2026, 2029, etc. So the white majority isn't, isn't an argument against this happening. Because the white majority contribute to the issue, contribute to the conversation. Sure, he goes on to explain later that it's like there are these white saviour liberals or, you know, just really woke idiots. <laughs> That's how I describe them. Woke idiots who actually 100% get behind the whole toy to tititi thing. But so long as the party might have influence over government decisions, so long as the Greens have influence over government decisions, this is not a an idle threat. We, we, we know the party Māori are going to be eager to implement their policy given the opportunity. We know that the Green Party will always take the opportunity to implement their policy, given how radical it is. Um, and we know that Labour isn't, isn't, isn't afraid of implementing radical policy that they haven't even campaigned on. You know, by comparison, National is the, the safe bet. If you want to, you know, have a risk of some silly Māori-related policy that you might not necessarily agree with, but can be comfortable that they're not going to implement any ridiculous, um, you know, uh, race-based decision-making powers, then then you can go national. <laughs> if you actually care about people being treated equally based on, um, you know, based on the very many different things that make us different, then there's only really two parties in parliament that, that provide that, and they only make up around 25% of, 15% uh, of the support. How is the white majority, how is the white majority saving us from radical Māori policy when only 15% of the population, of which include Māori, of which include Pacifica, of which include, you know, our other communities that aren't Europeans, how, 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 is, how are they going to stop us from a, a road taken that is fundamentally anti-democracy, anti-freedom, anti-equality. The argument simply doesn't stack up. These extreme pro-Maori policies will never happen. Modest co-governance and Maori names for government departments provoked major backlash. Do you seriously think there is any prospect of totally restructuring New Zealand around Maori interests? That is just delusional. I am all for idealism, but at a certain point, you have to be realistic and pragmatic. Otherwise, you will never achieve anything. The recently elected right-wing coalition constantly criticised modest pro-Maori policies, and they were rewarded with a strong electoral victory. 
and now some extremists have convinced themselves that radical pro-Maori reforms are probable, if not inevitable. What's interesting here, right, is he's, he's attributing Nationals, or the, the Coalition's, strong electoral victory to this issue. I think if we really look at it, there are only really two parties that benefited from that, and you could probably say it's it was enough to get New Zealand first over the line, and even then, that's probably more of the freedom vote on other issues, and it was enough to bounce Act maybe 1 or 2% because of the referendum, right? Or the proposed, or the intended will of a referendum, if we, if, if we get there. Let's hope we do. So, we're looking at maybe 3, 3%, if we're, if we're being, being realistic, um, that voted specifically to target this. Now, of course, that's just a guess, but specifically to target these kinds of issues. Because if you really cared about these issues more so than anything else, act on New Zealand first, you will save us bets the last election, right? And if we then look at national, really what they had going for them was how terrible Labour were. Economic management, non-existent. Therefore, National has a record of being okay. The last time our economy was really in a good place, it was kind of, you know, 2015 through to 2018. Um, and most of that was, was, was under National's governance. So National have that record. National were able to say, hey, look, we will get us, get, get us out of this situation. Um, obviously, you're all suffering from the cost of living under Labor's watch. And so that is really the fundamental um, driving factor behind their electoral victory on top of things like crime rates and so forth. So it, we can't sit here and say that it's this issue because this issue was really something that National spent the good majority of the election campaign trying to steer clear of. They weren't interested in discussing it where it, where, where it could be avoided. Um, and they actively called, you know, the likes of Act in New Zealand first um, out on some of these proposals um, saying that, uh, or, or not just these proposals, but other proposals, like particularly around things like, um, you know, gender and so forth. That it's out of this world. They tried to distance themselves. They tried to say, oh, all of these ideas pertaining to this issue and issues like gender, they're all a bit silly or they're, they're not really top of people's mind. And to a degree, they were right. They weren't top of people's mind. Not the majority of people's minds, that is. Certainly not of the, of the camp of trying to have a treaty referendum or so forth, as we can see by the actual election numbers. Only 15% rarely supported this kind of thing. It is just delusional. The left needs to focus its efforts on things that will actually happen, rather than wasting time and energy on pipe dreams. Ah yeah, and of course, and that's what he also finished off with, as he's talking about pretty much people on the far right. Almost as if those who are believers that there is an actual threat of extreme pro maori policy being implemented is something really focused on the far right. I notice he doesn't give any examples of the far right because personally myself, I've never met the far right um, in all of my discussions on this topic, all my interactions with people on this topic. I haven't seen the far right anywhere. So the fact that it's the far right purporting the ideas I am is also a little bit concerning to me. Surely you guys have seen my political compass. It's pretty moderate. It is becoming more and more right the more and more left they get. Um, and, that, and that's one of the other things. The more radical one side gets, the more radical the other side gets. Because to combat the radical, sometimes you feel like you need to get more radical. You get a bit more fed up with things. So it's like... Oh, you know, I'm fundamentally done with all this nonsense, so I'm going to be a little bit less lenient in my approach to dealing with it. it seems to be the way things go. So, yeah, I mean, the idea is that it's the far right purporting, purporting this, that they're the ones that are saying that it's actually a threat. I think that's fundamentally ridiculous. I don't look at Julian Batchelor and think he's far right. I just think he's a guy with a lot of hurt feelings. With, with in a with more experience that would lead him to pursue the well, pursue the, the campaign, the tour that he went on, than anyone else. He had means to do so, and he tried to do so based from a factual position, as much of a factual position as he could, given that he had skin in the game, that he had an emotional investment in it. But like that would mean that Julian Batchelor is far right, that I'm far right, that David Seymour is far right, that New Zealand First is far right. That, that is essentially what it means. You know, when I was at the Toy Tutia Tiriti protest 
several months ago was i there as a far-right extremist trying to cause trouble no i was there filming just watching why because they were the they were the extremists Many of them were just there and probably didn't even realize just how extreme what they were supporting were. In fact, I saw a, a couple of older white women being abused by a Maldi bloke because they were there. Despite the fact they were there in support. Funnily enough, I didn't get abuse from anyone bar one person who knew me from my online stuff and decided he would threaten me with violence. It's whatever. It's neither here nor there. doesn't really bother me. But, but it shows you that they have an undercurrent of extremists that are very much at the heart, at the heart of their entire movement. I mean, you can't look at Kitty Waititi Tamahiri and think, uh, or Tamahiri Waititi, and, and think that she's not an extremist. How could how how can you look at someone like that with the rhetoric coming out of their mouth and say that they're not an extremist? They demand to be viewed as someone who has complete sovereignty. They reject the validity of the crown. They reject the power and the sovereignty of our government. They reject it all. And they, they expect to be able to establish their own Māori parliament. I mean, this is the other thing. He, he, goes, he says that it's not politically popular, and yet is kind of ignoring the fact that Party Māori have already outlined they're not particularly a fan of our system. They're not particularly interested in following our system, our due course, our due process. They don't care. When they announced that they wanted to have Māori be politically independent and that they were going to establish their own parliament, they said they would go away and establish how they're going to do it. Or they're going to go away and discuss the, the, the specifics. They didn't say that we're going to go away and bring a bill to the parliament and, and try and get it passed. No, they said, we're going to go away we're going to talk about how exactly we want it all structured, and then we're going to do it. <laughs> I mean, do, does it sound like it matters if the majority care? <laughs> They're just going to do it. Let's just say tomorrow, 900,000 people wake up and decide that they don't recognize the sovereignty of the crown. They don't recognize the police as those that are there to enforce the laws, or at least, you know, arrest people when they break the laws. Sometimes. <laughs> but, but like, you know, that's what I mean. Imagine if 900,000 people tomorrow just decided to reject absolutely everything. Now, of course, 900,000 isn't a number that will actually happen because it's only a minority of Māori that actually support it. But let's say 100,000. Let's say 100,000 Māori tomorrow woke up and decided, I no longer recognise the government, I no, rec no longer recognise its laws, I no longer recognise the authority of the police, I no longer recognise the health system, the criminal justice system, the, the, the tax system, any of the systems. I don't recognise any of it. All I recognise is what my Māori chief says, or the person that we're appointing in charge of our Māori nation, our Māori parliament, all of this sort of stuff, whoever that happens to be. I only recognize them now. What do you do? Do you lock up 100,000 Māori? Do you? Because, I mean, I mean, I mean, what are we supposed to do? Genuinely, what are we supposed to do in that situation? Because that's, that's the route they're taking. That's the route their rhetoric suggests they're taking. That's the route their actions suggest they're taking. I am not saying that we should never do things that are unpopular. I am not saying that we should be purely pragmatic. I am not saying that we should never promote radical policy. I am arguing that we need to be at least somewhat realistic. I am arguing that we need to have a basic grasp of political reality. I am saying that radical pro maori policy is a politically unviable pipe dream. I also say this to calm down all the racists. Maori will never have total power over New Zealand. It is not going to happen. Take a deep breath, log off social media, and go to the country club. So, someone who believes that there is a, you know, a hypothetical, uh, just a chance that Maori would have complete control of New Zealand in some situation. That is just a view that racists hold. It's just for racists. I do find it interesting. He likes to throw around labels without describing what those things are. 
or, or examples of who these racists are. I'm, uh, uh, sure, he doesn't need to explain everything. I certainly haven't, you know, broken down every single label I've used in this. But he's being a little bit too general. You know, people who raise a threat about extreme pro Māori policy are far right. Those who believe it's a potential possibility that they try and take complete control are racists. Perhaps they're maybe full controlling New Zealand's a little bit extreme, a little bit too far. But the idea that it's not a threat that we have some ridiculous policy implemented which treats people differently based on their race, well, that's not a pipe dream at all. That's not some, you know, <laughs> that's, that's not some thing that people on the far right made up and will never happen. Elements of that has already happened. Uh, but Cash says, problem with Māori separatism is that Māori are integrated with us, they live with us, they don't live in one place, mostly they're not like Native Americans or Native uh, Canadians, um, etc. Exactly. Exactly. The thing about what they want to do is they don't want to do it like Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, which is what they've actually based their proposal off, at least based on their policy. That's Based on what they've proposed, they want devolved powers. They want the authority given to them from our government to be allowed to create laws and so forth and a variety of different areas, if they have it their way, every area, that only impact Māori. Now, the difference, the difference of that with what Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales have is theirs isn't based on ethnicity, it's based on where you live. So if you live in Scotland, those laws apply to you. If you live in Wales, those laws apply to you. If you live in Northern Ireland, those laws apply to you. The Party Māori want to do the exact same thing, but with race instead of location. So if you happen to have Māori blood in you, Māori ancestry, these laws apply to you, the others do not. You are required to join the Māori system, whether you want to or not. Or at least, it's not stated otherwise. It says, if you're on the Māori, you know, if you've got Māori ancestry, you go on the Māori role. That's what it says, more or less. So, yeah, that, that's the very thing that Vikash points out. That's what they want. They want to be able to dictate the law and the systems that someone uses based entirely on who their ancestors were. That ain't viable. But it's what they're planning on doing. It's what they've been advocating on doing. And it's exactly what they've managed to get tens of thousands of people around the country to march for. The majority of whom I doubt even think that's what's happening. But that's what they want. So many right-wingers seem to think that we are on the cusp of some kind of pro-Maori revolution. This is just utterly delusional. This is because the right has no serious solutions, so they are reliant on mindless fear-mongering. Mindless fear-mongering. Reminds me a lot of the left, actually. The Maori Party is powerless, and in all likelihood, they always will be. Unless they drop the mindless extremism and start acting like adults. That is how they became powerful in the past. The current path of extremism is good if you like passionate protests, but it will never give you any real power. What is the most number of MPs? that the Māori Party had prior to its Te Pāti Māori rebrand. Unless I'm mistaken, it was like two, right? I mean, the, the most prominent time where they had the most influence would have been under Key Era, right? Would have been under the Key Era. <laughs> They've now got six. Now, I know this is entirely because of the Māori role, um, the, the, uh, the Māori electorates, right? Entirely because of that. But they still got 3% and six electorate seats. I mean, clearly it's resonating with enough people on the Māori roll. And that should concern you. So, so yeah, it's not really stacking up this whole idea that they don't have power unless they drop, or they won't have any influence again unless they drop the, the extremist stuff. The extremist stuff has made them three times more powerful or influential than last time they were in, in any sort of realistic position of power. I mean, it wasn't a dramatic swing in support from national to labour, or just New Zealand first not making the threshold for the for the party to actually have a place potentially in cabinet. So uh, yeah, <laughs> let's uh, slow down on the they don't have any influence ideas. The extreme policies will never be implemented. They are a total pipe dream. 
Often these policies are just about virtue signalling and exciting the base. Often these policies are just about role-playing revolutionaries and feeling like radicals. I mean, he's got that much right. And that's what I mean. Yes, some things are right. They 100% are just role-playing revolutionaries. Um, and that that's what they are. But sometimes, when the political climate is right, role-playing as revolutionaries is very effective. And that's what they're doing. They've spent many, many decades, right? There's been... Uh, throughout academia and throughout politics in general, there has just been a slow shift towards narratives that support that support this radical agenda, that support this radical idea. And so long as that's maintained, so long as academia is still convinced that Māori never ceded sovereignty, that majority of the things that are really the basis of what party might are advocating for the more and more of a threat that becomes the less and less radical it will seem to a larger uh, portion of the population right they don't many people don't view what party might are advocating for as radical they view it as justice because we've got more and more people who lack the ability to think for themselves just adopting whatever the left says as long as it has oh it's justice next to it We'll support, we'll support. That's why you get the silly old sausages with the Ukraine-Palestine trans flags in their bio, right? Because they can't think for themselves. They have no serious potential. They are not serious policies. These policies do not have the capacity for broad popular support. They appeal exclusively to a very small minority. Countless Maori reject these policies. They are not popular at all. And they lack the potential to become popular because they are by their nature only appealing to extremely small groups of radical activists. Extreme Maori nationalists and white guilt-stricken liberals. One of the many reasons why I favour class-based solutions to inequality is because these policies are politically viable. They have the capacity to mobilise broad support. They are broadly appealing to people. And they benefit Maori massively because Maori are disproportionately poor. Most of the issues that Maori face stem from disproportionate poverty. Yes, yeah, so what he's doing here is saying the issues that Maori facing are facing is more to do with classism than it is racism. And he's actually not wrong. He's actually not wrong. The, the biggest um, indicator to me of why Maori are overrepresented in so many negative statistics is the fact that they are overrepresented in. Um, lower socioeconomic communities and what is something that is so mu- uh, far more common in lower socioeconomic communities than others crime rates gang membership drug and alcohol abuse all of these things all of which dramatically influence your outcomes in all the various different areas where maori are struggling so much it really actually isn't very difficult to figure all that out but it doesn't fit the narrative it doesn't fit the narrative the fact that academia won't even really teach you this. They will say that rather than it being a class issue, it's a racist issue. In fact, it's only racism that is resulting in them being in this, well, lower class. And so in order to prevent them from being in lower socioeconomic communities, you have to solve the racism, ignoring the fact that they're not in lower socioeconomic communities because of racism, but rather because of class, and then the fact that they are blaming racism on it, resulting in them remaining in those lower socioeconomic communities because they're not actually attacking the primary issue. And that's the thing, right? If you don't acknowledge what is wrong and you try and blame it on something else, you don't actually solve the issue. So if anything, the academics are actually oppressing Māori, but that's that, that's my whole thing. Māori aren't oppressed by the white man, they're oppressed by ideology, in this case, left-wing ideology, progressive ideology. They're being oppressed by the very ideology they themselves adopt. They're oppressing themselves. It really isn't that hard to figure out, but it actually takes thinking for yourself, which people aren't a fan of these days. They just aren't a fan of it. Much of the oppression that Māori face is class-based oppression. Crush class-based oppression, and many of the hideous inequalities will begin to disappear. We can be radical, but we must be at least somewhat pragmatic about it. I do not worry about the more insane proposals too much, because they will never amount to anything. But they risk normalising a racialized radical form of politics. 
they risk bringing radical racial politics into the mainstream of political discourse. In doing so, creating territory ideal for far-right politics, which is politically viable. My main concern is that they will normalise racialized politics, bring racism into the mainstream, and pave the path upon which the far-right will one day walk. The far right is much more politically viable as they cater to a powerful majority, not a powerless minority. Hear that? The far right's a bunch of white fellas. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I feel like the far right's more likely to be elected, um, and with the exception of France, um, clearly. Um, <laughs> Simon would know. Um, they're more likely to be elected and then become far right then be far right already and then get elected um it, it really depends i suppose on the on on how the, the position of the nation is and if the nation's in absolute tatters because of the left the far right's probably going to have a good shot just by being um well by focusing on a few things that are a little bit more moderate whilst having a bunch of crazy radical far right shit in the background um and you know so there's that but the whole the argument he's trying to make is that the more ridiculous the left is, the more extreme the left is, the more the left wants to focus on race, the more likely the right is to focus on race, the more this becomes a race issue, the more that racists basically um, can control the narrative and then come to power through that being the sole political topic or the primary political topic of the day. Because, of course, as we know, if the right debates racism in any capacity, it means they're far right. It means that they're racists. And so that's just how it is. And as, as and that's the most flawed part about his entire position is that anyone who debates race on the right must be a racist or must be more to the right. Pretty much been the theme of the entire video. It's the left needs to stop being silly or the party Māori needs to stop being silly, stop promoting these radical ideas because they're never going to happen. The left is never going to implement these radical ideas because they know they're silly and will never happen and because they're so politically unpopular. And that the right attempting to talk about it is a bad idea because that just means they're racist. Whatever. So these radical fantasies on the left are not harmless. Some of them normalise a racial form of politics that is very dangerous. All of them create conditions ideal for far-right backlash. The ridiculous radical pro-Maori policy proposals. The far-right loves this kind of thing. It is the fuel of their movement. It is the kind of opponent that they dream of. And I will note, yes, New Zealand has a far-right, but do you know what they're called? It's just, so, it's so small. It is genuinely so small that the idea that he wants to make this conversation about really to party Māori promoting policy which riles up the far right it just doesn't doesn't work with me the majority of people who are pissed off with to party Māori are moderate to centre right okay they they're, they're centrists who very much have some key fundamental beliefs that they expect whoever they elect to be in alignment with and that's why they're in the middle because they kind of swing both ways and i have in the past they're people like me they're people like the majority of people who have watched this video who aren't far right maybe they are right maybe they are conservative sure but when it comes down to it all they want is for a nation which is not which is not racist a nation which does not create race-based systems race-based decision making all of it is based on ideas which are in themselves not radical in any way whatsoever but that we're told it's radical to oppose that's why it doesn't make any sense when the majority of people who take issue are not the far right but those who are very normal who have very very moderate views you cannot gaslight us into thinking that discussion on this is only Fueling the far right, that the only people who could possibly have an issue with it are the far right, and that Te Party Māori are just silly wannabe radicals who are playing a game for no real reason. It is great for promoting their own hideous views and winning support for their disgusting movement. 
and 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 this is the thing is i'm actually i'm genuinely sitting here trying to think what what individual in this country that is any in, in any position really advocating for a political movement political party is sitting there promoting political views political policies that are inherently disgusting that are repulsive that are actually racist i cannot think of a single person anywhere so again that's why i want to say why are we making this a discussion between the extreme pro maori policy that you believe will never happen and the far right which no one knows about we acknowledge they exist in a very tiny subsect somewhere but that no one really knows about at all it makes the left look like a bunch of crazy radicals who have no interest in realistic pragmatic policy making the left needs to focus our efforts on things that will actually happen rather than wasting time and energy on deluded pipe dreams in my view many of the proposed extreme pro maori policies are undesirable they are divisive they fail to address underlying issues they fail to account for various factors, they make naive assumptions, they normalise dangerous forms of politics. They are bad for everyone, including Maori. But this debate feels like a total waste of time, because above all else, these policies are just unviable. It is like arguing about what dead world leader should be revived to lead New Zealand. It might be an interesting conversation, but it lacks any serious political potential. We need to focus on practical pro maori policy that is politically viable. Putting an end to poverty would be a good start. Because radical class-based policy does have the potential for broad public support. We must adopt practical strategies for eliminating the grotesque inequalities that plague our society. We must abandon the radical fantasies that will never amount to anything. The radical fantasies that serve only to make the left look deranged and idiotic. We must abandon these radical fantasies. Did you hear that, everyone? The solution. The solution to all our issues with the party Māori is just to adopt socialism. Problem solved? Problem solved.